Okay, I will try to go fast and maybe to skip some parts and uh, just to present uh, an overview of uh, some uh, very nice and interesting kind of localization in metallic alloys, uh, which are usually denoted as uh, Portevin Le Chatelier effect or bands and uh, Luders or Puber Luders bands. Um, for those who do not know what it is, it's uh, a phenomenon that appears uh, during tensile tests in metallic alloys that can uh, appear in, in two different types. The first one, which is rather famous, is uh, the Luders phenomenon that occurs at the transition between elastic and plastic part of the curve, and that consists in a yield peak like that, followed by a stress plateau and then a smooth curve at the end, and you can observe it in many, many materials, but especially in uh, low carbon steels, um, like low, low quality steels. Um, and Portevin Le Chatelier is that thing, the uh, occurrence on the tensile curve. After a given level of plasticity of some huge serration, uh, that can uh, be uh, as large as 10 or 20 uh, megapascal. <laughs> and uh, it's not a problem with the machine, okay? That's the problem with the material. But uh, when it occurs, you will hear from, from here and you can listen this phenomena. It's like all along the curve. And it's due to the fact that they still have an, an interaction between the answer and the material. And, uh, and, and the machine, uh, you have some elastic energy that is stored and released and so on. But uh, that's not a problem with your machine. You, you, when you get that, it's due to the material. It mainly appears in uh, aluminum alloys, but also in many others. And that's what I will present today is uh, where you can observe this phenomena, these two phenomena, what's the physical reasons for that, and uh, how we can model it and, uh, and play with that. So, uh, as, uh, as I said, uh, these two phenomena are, uh, get the same physical origin, and that's why in some material you can have both of them simultaneously. For example, in this uh, carbon uh, steel, uh, you will have the Luders phenomena and then some Portevin Le Chatelier effect at the same time if you are on the uh, adequate range of temperature here is 200 degrees. What is important to observe on that curve as well, contrary to this one where all the curves were shifted, then if you put all them together, they are almost uh, on the same level. In this uh, still, uh, there is no shift. And what is interesting is that the slower is the stronger, which is not the case in general for a uh, metallic material because of viscous effect in general, uh, the faster, the stronger. Here it's the opposite, and you can see that the slower speeds give the higher level of stress, and the faster give the lower level. And that's something which is typical from this phenomena, and that helps to explain the instability that we will observe. Uh, as I say, we have many material. In fact, I think almost uh, all metallic industrial material uh, alloys uh, have a range in which you can find this kind of phenomena. Uh, for example, for nickel based super alloy, it's a bit higher at 500 degrees, but you have the same thing. You have things in twip steels, modern steels, or, or so on, or so on. And we even observed it in some uh, heterogeneous material. This one is very original since it's a composite composed by a uh, 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 metal matrix and uh, uh, inside which you have some inclusion of uh, ceramics, of uh, aluminum oxide, and the volume fraction of uh, ceramics is something like 60%, so it's rather high. And we can imagine that it would have suppressed the phenomena, but not. Uh, you still have some uh, Portevin Le Chatelier effect, even if it remains only 40% of matrix. And um, that's something which is strange, but this effect is very, very strong. What is associated with this serration? What's the, um, the, what, what we can also observe in the specimen when you, you pull on it is 
some bands of plasticity, and that's a very, very original uh, localization phenomena since it is heterogeneous and it is propagative. Then it's not like uh, the kind of localization like necking or so on when, well, once you have localization it remains on a given place and uh, everything will occur here. Uh, here in this case you have propagation and you see that the bands occur, move and so on. And that makes this phenomenon rather hard to understand and to uh, and to investigate. Um, just, uh, excuse me, just yep. to understand your point, because I am not at all familiar with this topic. Your uh, Luder's lines clearly are not shear bands. Mm, what do you call shear bands? <laughs> ah, a shear band, as defined by uh, Ahmed, with the three conditions, uh, continuity of the stress, a given constitutive relation and a kinematic definition. And this is uh, the definition of the shear band? Local, I would say localization band, because the shear in our... Okay, so yeah. localization band, yes. uh, as, uh, as defined by, uh, by uh, Hill Rice, with uh, a clear criterion, the vanishing value of the determinant of the acoustic uh, uh, tensor. My question is, maybe Luder's lines are slip lines as defined in the um, uh, limit plastic theory. Slip lines are given by this hyperbolic system of equation uh, given by uh, the, the equilibrium equation and the plastic limit condition. So my question is, Luder's lines are probably not shear band. Are Luder's la lines slip lines in the meaning as defined by the, by the plastic limit theory. I'm not sure to understand what's the real difference between both kind of localization uh, since I mean... Slip lines are, are not considered as localization in the classical, in the classical uh, theory of plasticity. Yeah, but I mean if Why? you see the, the curve yeah. you're showing, you know, you have a pick. Yeah. You have soft tuning. When you get down, you have softening, and then that's. You want me to stop? The, 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 the big difference, you know, that you have between uh, the band and what is what measuring? What I have been talking is, is that you have this plateau, the and then it's, it's which means that okay, I will answer. You, you know, you have a, a band, <laughs> and what's happening you now? The band is getting smaller and smaller. And yeah, it, it's localized. It doesn't happen here because your material is going up, and then this stop. Mm. the localization process itself. I would say that the main, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure to see the, the point and I, I will give some more, exam, more examples and we can discuss, continue the discussion later. I would say... Already in depth, this, you don't have enough time. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would say that the main difference for me, it's, it's not a band of localization of strain, that's the band of localization of strain rate and this later propagates. And uh, that's the, for me uh, the example that I, I, I used to, to, to give is the, the example of painting. Okay, uh, usual localization like I may say is I have, a, I have a paint and I put it there and I stay there and there is more and more and more paint at this position. That's uh, shear bands. Everything goes on the same position and nothing elsewhere. And Luder's band and uh, bands like, like Portemain Le Chatelier, I'm doing that. I'm painting the specimen and moving. Yeah. Get, uh, but Portevin, you know, it's, the band is there and it Yeah, but it's just that to do that and that and of that. Course, and okay, but that's yeah. the same. It's just the propagating pattern that is not the same. Okay, just to answer and continue uh, to yeah. the question. Here there is no artifact. It's just an uh, ice view. I have no, no, nothing else than a camera. So there is no digital image correlation or things like that. You just make your experiment, put your eyes, and that's what you look with the correct light. Uh, nothing else. Okay, but so that's why, what why the color changes? The color changes because you have intense plasticity in some position and the fact that uh, out of plane movement and so on. Changes. Plasticity changes the, the aspect. You can do some digital or image correlation as well. Or you can observe also the band by making te thermographic observation. Here is temperature, 
but uh, whatever the way you are observing, you see almost the same thing, the propagation of, of, of the band. And um, what I was saying about the paint and the strain and strain rate, if you observe the temperature, you can see that the temperature will increase like that. And if you observe just the source, then you see that it uh, propagates. This one is equivalent to the strain, and this one equivalent to strain rate. Okay? So at the end, here is the overall quantity of paint, and here is just the position of the, of the, paint, of the brush. Hey, how much is in Kelvin? It depends. In some cases, it's uh, 0.5, and some cases, it's 2 or 3 Kelvin. It depends on the material. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's something which is significant that you can easily observe with a uh, thermographic uh, camera. And here is a digital image correlation for a shear test. And that was another example, just to, to illustrate that you can observe it whatever the way you, you observe by measuring temperature, strain, or even by eye, you, you see the result. Um, I will explain the physical meaning uh, just uh, two slides later. But the idea that you have to keep in mind is that this phenomena is uh, limited to a given range in the temperature strain rate domain. And I will explain why later. But it's, uh, it's an, in, in a given domain. Uh, between two temperature and between two strain rate. And uh, the reason is that the negative sensitivity to strain rate that I've shown previously is also limited to a given domain. And the phenomena can also only occur in this domain between two temperature or between two strain rate. And it's why it's interesting to, uh, to investigate that is because we have a huge uh, modification of the metallic, uh, the, the material properties of the material in this domain. For example, the ductility with fall down in this domain drastically, and uh, also the property uh, for fatigue or for so on. And it's highly non monotonic. And for uh, industrial partners, uh, they, they are uh, concerned by the question because they do not like this kind of evolution. They, they like evolution like that. Whereas I can have one point there, one point there, and a line between them. And it's not the case for this material, and so that's why it's important to understand. The physical uh, explanation for this phenomena was uh, proposed initially by uh, a paper uh, some years ago uh, by Cottrell and Bilby. And uh, the main idea is that uh, close to uh, this location, uh, edge dislocation, there is uh, some uh, particular position that are most favorable for solute atoms. Uh, in particular, just uh, at this point, it's more favorable than there. If you uh, compute the potential, the interaction potential between what's given solute atom and a dislocation, you can see that all positions are not equivalent. And if you leave uh, material well in, in, on a table during... Uh, a sufficient long time, or uh, you leave it uh, in a in, well, what works well is uh, to make a heat treatment at a high temperature. Then all the solute atoms in the material will move toward the most favorable position. I mean, just below the dislocation. And once they are there, they will uh, block the movement of the dislocation. We are talking about a pinned st uh, state, it means that the dislocation cannot move anymore. And then to move, she will uh, have to, uh, you will uh, require an overstress that will help us, uh, the dislocation to, to release from this, uh, this cloud of solute atoms that were uh, attached to her. And uh, in fact, there are two modes. Depending on the velocity of the dislocation, you can have either unpinning mode. It means that the dislocation is able to release from the, the cloud of solute atoms. Either you have what is called dragging mode. It means that the dislocation moves, but the atoms are able to move uh, close to her. And uh, in fact, the Portevin Le Chatelier effect is uh, located in the domain which is limited in terms of temperature and strain rate because uh, it's the place where the competition between two modes is, uh, um, is fair. Okay, it means that for a very high 
domains in terms of strain rates, the dislocation are moving too fast and then you never get the dragging mode. Okay? On the contrary, when the temperature has very, are very high, solute atoms are able to move fast and then you are always in dragging mode. Okay? And you have the two other cases that I haven't discussed, but uh, you, you imagine why we have such domain in just the domain where we will always have competition between this uh, unpinning mode and dragging mode. So in the article, uh, there are some mathematical development that explain okay, and compute what's the overstress that is needed to uh, release from these solute atoms. And in fact, the, the Luder's instability is just that. You have this location that are all of them pinned by some cloud of solute atoms and you will require this peak, this overstress to make them moving. And once some of them success to move, then all you have an avalanche phenomena that will uh, cross all over the specimen and release all the dislocation from their cloud and uh, you get this propagation and once the propagation has uh, crossed all the specimen then uh, you have a classical plasticity that is observed. Uh, what, what uh, in, the, in the mechanism is, uh, is interesting is that this theory that was built by Cottrell and Bilby is, uh, is still the one that is used in, uh, in, the, in the phenomenological model that are uh, designed actually in finite element code to, 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 to make simulation of, of this phenomena. And it's rather simple, it say that because of this phenomena there is an overstress that is a function of the time. Uh, since uh, if, you s if the dislocation are pinned uh, for uh, enough long time, then the overstress increase. I'll skip all the uh, improvement that has been made in the model from there to there. Yeah, okay. I'll go to the, the simulation and, uh, and show uh, some results given by the mechanical model. Um, Ahmed knows this model uh, was uh, rather well since we uh, have both made uh, a lot of simulation playing with this, uh, this model. It's a classical elastoviscoplastic model, okay, with uh, isotropic or uh, else hardening uh, flow rules like Norton 1. And in fact, we just add an overstress, an edging hardening that will represent the overstress due to the interaction between dislocation and solute atoms. And this later is related to uh, an edging time, that means how long the dislocation were pinned. And the kinetics of this edging time is very simple and that's a, a, a relation that um, is the same than the one you find in some geomechanics model that's called the uh, weight and rate or state and rate. You know rate about that? State. Rate and state model. State. And that's exactly the same equation. It means that uh, either you stay there, either you move fastly. And uh, this equation, I think it's exactly the same with a characteristic time uh, that is related to the overall uh, plastic flow rate. And uh, so that's something very, very similar. But P dot is your, uh, your mean stress? It's the mean uh, plastic stra strain. A strain. Strain, strain yeah. So uh, strain rate, strain rate. The, the mean plastic strain rate. And I think if you mix both equations, you find back exactly the same one. Uh, I used to, to work on that. At the end, if you combine all the contribution of, uh, of these different terms, what you get is that the overall stress response of my material as a function of strain rate gets three domains. One, which is rate positive with a positive rate sensitivity, then a negative, then a positive rate sensitivity. And what you get is just that here for the very low strain rate in this part, in fact, the dislocation are moving too slow and then the solute atoms will, will always move, 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 move with them. And the competition is unfair. Here you are on the other domain. The competition is also unfair, but it's because the dislocation are moving too fast for the clouds. And here you have a domain where the competition is fair. And because the stress due to the cloud makes this part of the curve higher than this one, you have a negative domain between both. And this negative domain induces a kind of softening, but it's not a softening in terms of uh, relation between stress and strain. It's a softening in terms of relation between stress and strain rate. And that's what is uh, original. 
In fact, there are for me two things original. One is the fact that it depends on strain rate and not on strain, and the other thing is that you have a, a hardening that, become, that comes later. Uh, and that's uh, two, 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 two things that are specific. Because if you look at the, the picture by, by Ahmed, you, you have some material that have a constitutive law like that in terms of stress versus strain. And the localization pattern in this case is, uh, is original since uh, uh, it, it will not remain at a given position, it will propagate. But it, this one is even more original since here it's strain rate and not strain. So that's, some, that's a second difference be, compared with classical uh, localization plast plasticity. Uh, okay. I will skip. I, if you observe the, the <laughs> that's the overall uh, behavior of a given material which experience this kind of uh, uh, the, of behavior, uh, you see that the, the global answer is 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 very chaotic in in a given sense. Uh, it's the stress versus strain and strain rate, and you see that you have some heel and so on, and that's uh, uh, something that is. Um, well, at the end, it's normal to have some instability and propagation. So, uh, if you put it in a finite element code, that's what you get. If you prescribe an initial pin state, it means that you, uh, well, you give a, a given value to some state variable such that uh, the material is uh, like if all the dislocations were, were pinned. Uh, what you get is the Luders phenomena with the peak, the plateau, the propagation and the, of the band, and then uh, uh, the, the hardening at the end. And in fact, we do not have a band of plastic deformation. You see, that's the, that's the accumulated plastic deformation. But what we get is a band of plastic strain rate. Because uh, if you make the derivative of that, what you will see is a band that goes Plastic deformation, yeah, not the plastic strain rate. If you plot the plastic strain rate, what you get is just a band that goes from the bottom to the up. I think that what we get here, where I do not plot the plastic strain, but the plastic strain rate, okay, there. And what you get is bands that are going everywhere uh, in the specimen. But for me, it's almost the same. It's just one is chaotic and the other one is regular. But it's, uh, it's almost the same. So it makes very, very beautiful picture and, uh, <laughs> and uh, that's it. Um, okay, since I, I do not have that many time, just to introduce some, some discussion, what is interesting with this model is to be able to forecast what is the deformation for which uh, instability occur. Since, uh, in fact, it's rather... Uh, atypical to see that you, we are in a hardening domain and before that we have homogeneous plasticity and for a given level of deformation well you have the beginning of serration just a transition a bifurcation in a, in a given sense uh, the way how we solved it uh, and what we have proposed was um, a prediction that was based on a linear perturbation method uh, um, making, in fact, the perturbation of the evolution of the of the um, of the state variable, and the particular point in in this case was that uh, the what is, what I call the dynamic criterion, which is the one used uh, usually, which means that I have to get the real part of one eigenvalue becoming positive, which means uh, this kind of evolution. Uh, so it's uh, oscillating, growing perturbation. Does not work. It does not work since if you use it, what you get comparing the finite element response and uh, this criterion is something which is not in agreement. And in fact, the stability criterion that seems to work is this one, is the fact that the eigenvalue has to be purely positive and real. It means a perturbation that is uh, hyperbolic and growing. And our explanation is that uh, the evolution law for uh, plasticity 
in particular are uh, not uh, fully continuous because the plastic strain cannot decrease. And then we have some brackets in some uh, equation that makes this later, uh, well, it continues, but non derivative, in fact, at zero. And we think that it's why it's this criterion that works and not this one. Usually, uh, this is a naive question. Usually, this kind of behavior in blue is called divergence instability, yes. and this behavior in red is called flutter instability. Mm. Is that. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, th th this is this kind of. Uh, mm, of analysis, yeah. Okay. But in general, the flutter is the one that is relevant to, to forecast uh, the occurrence of instability. I mean. Oh, it depends. It depends. Uh, it depends, but in finite element simulation, uh, if you have a given model and uh, make the, the corresponding finite element simulation, in general, the, the red one. Uh, is enough, but maybe I'm not uh, aware both enough can, of both can be. Both can be uh, mm. Well, in this case, the blue one is clearly the uh, the most accurate one. Um, another another phenomena, but I think Samuel will give some word on that, so I I won't go. Is that the, the uh, because of the fact that we still have some softening, uh, the model is highly uh, mesh dependent, and in particular, the mesh orientation plays a role. So if you compare the simulation with a mesh like that and a mesh like that, you, you see the, the result. Uh, you have a nice plateau or you have something uh, horrible. So we made some simulation with a second gradient uh, approach in order to get rid of that. And I think uh, that Samuel will give some, some words so I won't get an, and I can discuss. Um, because if the end, <laughs> And we are on a... Uh, yeah, the details of how you're doing the second gradient, maybe you will tell, you will tell us... You will discuss about that, Samuel, a bit? A bit, yeah. A bit, yeah, so he can explain uh, how... Because it's a, mic a classical mi mic micromorphic, uh, but... Mm. And, and you get the, the result there, but I think I will skip, then he will, uh, he will uh, present that. What I just want to show, and we will finish with that, is for the future the kind of simulation that we are trying to do right now is to go towards uh, heterogeneous media and to simulate uh, this kind of phenomena uh, in uh, heterogeneous uh, material in particular in uh, polycrystalline aggregates I just show you one video of what we can get. So here is the simulation of a tensile test in a plastic polycrystalline aggre aggregates with uh, crystal plasticity without aging phenomena. No leaders, no PLC. What you get is plasticity, and plasticity remains when you have uh, well, the, the weaker grain. And if I were able to go further, I think that I would have a localization maybe here and necking and so on. I haven't done that, but that, that could be interesting. And if you do the same with aging terms, you can see, and that's what we want to investigate, the nucleation and the propagation on the band in this kind of, uh, of material. The idea is to understand the role of the, um, of the grain size, for example, and this kind of aspect in uh, the feature of the bands. And uh, to, 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 to make some investigation across the scale, I would say, because, uh, and I will leave Samuel explain about that, we are wondering about what's the meaning of the internal lengths that we have to put in the second gradient model uh, in order to make simulation uh, that are mesh independent. And we wonder if there is a link, for example, with this grain size. And so that's why we are also going on that direction. Okay, sorry to be too long. So <laughs>